Welcome to the show. I am your host, Brian Lee Watley. Our story begins tonight with our very special guest, Grammy winner and country music legend, Gary Morris. Gary's voice is the only instrument needed to move listeners' hearts and souls. His career in country music began in the early 1980s when Morris produced 12 albums that generated 16 top 10 singles and 5 number 1 hits, including Baby Bye Bye, 100 percent chance of rain and leave me lonely he is probably best known for his 1984 original recording of wind beneath my wings which won both the country music association and the academy of country music song of the year awards at the height of his nashville recording career he boldly accepted the heroic lead role of jean valjean in les measurables on broadway more finally and his famous rendition of Bring Him Home can be found on the platinum-selling Grammy Award-winning international cast album. He received resounding critical praise, including a Best Actor nomination from the highly respected Drama Desk for a performance that would set the standard for this uniquely challenging role. Gary has sung in front of amazing people as well, including Her Majesty the Queen, Presidents of the United States, Olympic gold medalists, and countless places around the world, including Russia. And after a self-imposed hiatus for music to focus on other ventures, Gary has returned to the road and to the studio, much to the delight of his fans releasing new albums and singles, and sharing with the world his amazing voice and personality. Gary's a true legend, from his first start on the music scene to his continued drive and success touching hearts and souls of millions, spanning generations and generations to come. Well, our musical guest is, of course, Gary Morris, with several of his famous recordings and this new song coming out now, If You Were Mine. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to our show, Gary. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Brian, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I just just got out of the studio, so it's kind of cool to be able to go kick back and and, uh, talk to somebody about music for a while. (laughs) <laughs> That's nice. Well, like I said, it's definitely a pleasure for me to talk to you about you and your work. Um, for all of our listeners who may not have been obviously under a rock for so many years, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself a little bit more than what I what I mentioned? Sure, sure. I grew up in Texas, and uh, and uh, I actually learned how to sing. I guess you would say in a Southern Baptist church, and um, that's where I first started singing and went off to school on a on a football scholarship, played football and baseball. And, and uh, between my sophomore and junior year of college, uh, two other boys in Texas said, hey, you want to go to Colorado for a summer? And uh, I loaded up. I had a 62 Chevy and uh, it was nice. a, an old beater. And I drove to Colorado with them and, uh, and got really my my first taste of uh, performing. Um uh, the three of us had a little trio, and you know, we stopped at a bar on the way, Brian, uh, in Colorado Springs. We were on our way to Boulder, but we stopped oh, yeah, at this bar. And, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I love Colorado. In fact, I have a ranch there still now. Oh, I love but, it, too. Yeah. yeah. So we we stopped at this little bar called the Golden Bee at, at the Broadmoor Hotel. It was about probably 10 o'clock at night on the first drive up, and we went into this bar, uh because uh, one of the boys said, hey, this is kind of a happening place. And there was this 150-year-old Dixieland woman playing piano in this bar, and it was packed. And when she took a break, my uh, buddy went up to the bartender and said, hey, could the three of us break out our acoustic guitars and sing a couple of songs? He said, sure. So we, were, we ran to our car and got the guitars and went in and uh, stood up on a, uh, on chairs by this table and this, this kind of... With this bar and play, we we only knew three or four songs together, <laughs> and and they passed a tray around and they collected. I think the number was thirty five dollars, and I did the math and said, this might be what I want to do. And that was kind nice. of the beginning of, of of me playing music for a living. I ended up staying. We we got a job playing music in this club in Denver and. At the end of the year, I was going back to Texas Tech to play football, and uh, and I went, you know what? I've got ruptured disc and broken bones, and I think maybe music might be what I want to do. <laughs> and, and so that that takes me zip forward to today. And so that's kind of the the early days with me were uh, were not about music; they were about athletics. So that's cool because I coached four year old football for one of the city parks here. 
um, broadcasting yep. out of Mobile, Alabama, and um, I absolutely love it. My son's six years old, and he loves playing football as well. And on mm-hmm. top of that, he also loves music. And so when I was telling him, I was like, this is who's going to be on the show, and he got all excited because I started playing him your music and the fact that you play guitar because he loves guitar and everything mm-hmm. else. And so um, that's cool that um, you play. I was one of the weird kids, Brian, <laughs> because see, I, I lettered in four sports in high school, and then I then I, I sang with the choir, and nobody else did that. You know, it's like I I, uh, I I I didn't know any better or whatever. I I loved to sing, but but uh, athletics were really kind of my focus, and then. Suddenly, I find myself doing music for a living. So I, I started writing songs when I was, you know, the first song you write is for your girlfriend. Right. The second <laughs> song you write is for your girlfriend, and it's a new girlfriend. And then the third song. So uh, now I've got way too many songs that are for too many girlfriends. But that was what kind of what happened early on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you said you just got out of the studio um, working on one of your projects, but your song spans so far um like I said, the genre wise, I think one of the most important ones that I know in terms of maybe this is just me saying it, but in terms of women really like, and you know, to be honest with you, I, I love the song too, but it's Wind Beneath My Wings. That's one of the number one songs. You also have Baby Bye Bye, The Love She Found in Me, 100% Chance of Rain, and Leave Me So Lonely. I love all of those songs. Um, Wind Beneath My Wings is a very, very powerful song. Um, is there one of those that is one of your favorites? That you've you've written. Well, I, I love to sing wind. I, I was I was trying to. You know, it's funny you should ask because uh, just the other day I was trying to figure out if I could count how many times I've sung wind beneath my wings <laughs> in my life. But, uh, and, I'm not going to ask you today. Song of the year, it's a lot. I, I uh, it was song of the year in 19, 19, for 1983, and that's been 93 to the almost 30 years ago. So I have to figure. I, I sang it uh, at least 150 times a year oh for 30 years. So, you know, four or five thousand times, and <laughs> and and uh, and and yet, I never get tired of of, of singing the song. And, and I've sung it. Uh, I've, 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 I've sung it at a couple of funerals of people that were very close oh. to me that uh, they'd asked me to sing it. Uh, and uh, I think I sang it at two weddings, and I'm, I'm not oh. real big on going out and doing weddings. Right. But uh, but some some guy had more money than sense and wanted me to come sing one song at his wedding. And and uh, but um, so so it's it's kind of a universal song that you know it's played at bar mitzvahs, high school graduations, <laughs> funerals, weddings, birthdays. Anniversaries and 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 I'm I'm really lucky to have it yeah. and and you know what when when you leave wind there was another song called the love you found in me that I really really liked it was a uh, Bob Morrison and uh, Dennis Lindy song uh, I really like that song but when you leave those two particular pieces of of uh, material in, in in my life I get kind of into the uh, Singer songwriter stuff, which is what I really love, and, and I one like there's a song called Finishing Touches, which is on one of my records, and mm-hmm. I love to sing it, and, and and I get a lot of requests for it, which means somebody bought the CD and listened to more than just the hits on it because uh, it was not a single, and there's a lot of those things on uh, the records I've had that that I, I like to sing. They're fun to sing, uh, and they're when you when you create them, when you start with a tablet and a pencil and a guitar and end up with a piece of uh, material, that, that it's a really a fulfilling uh, uh, journey. So I have a lot of those, including the newest thing that I, that uh, we'll talk about after a while. It's called "If You Were Mine." Uh, it, I wrote right. it, and uh, and and I love uh, I love the record on it. I'm uh, I'm perhaps a little bit different than a lot of the guys that y'all will uh, have on your show, but I love to go out alone, just with the guitar. And I, and I've had a great band. I've had a band that can play with anybody. But but when you go into a place and you just take your guitar, and um, and I've played for ten thousand 
alone with a guitar. And when you when ten thousand people get quiet, it's deafening. I can imagine. And, uh, that's that's the, that's one of the coolest things that uh, you can do when you're a performer, or for me anyway. So, but uh, and, and all that came from your simple question of did I like one of those five number <laughs> ones? And uh, and, and uh, yes, I love to sing wind, but I have a lot of songs that I, I like to sing on a regular basis. Here's Gary with one of his most profound songs, Wind Beneath My Wing. In my Never had on your feet. You've been content to let me. Some of the stuff in terms of um, helping other songwriters and, and things like that is I've heard you, you say before, whether you write songs, you write poetry or anything like that, and I love writing poetry myself, but it's one of your favorite expressions that I, I really like is you said it's okay to it's it's okay to, to be over. It's okay to be over. Yes, I think that's what it was. That's right. It's okay to be over. Now, why is that so I, special? Well, here, here's the deal. I uh, owned a publishing company. I had a bunch of writers who worked for me, and uh, I published a song called The River that was a big number one record for Garth. And yeah. I love the way you love me that one song of the oh, year. Yeah. 
and and um, <clears throat> writers would come to me, and and uh, they would uh, play something, and I I'd, and, and kind of ask me if I wanted to edit it for them, or and I might say something like. Uh, you know, it's a little long, or I, I did, I did, I don't understand what you, what you, what you meant there. But then again, it's okay to be over. If it's, if you're finished with it, let's live with that. And, and you can go, um, you can go in the studio, and, uh, I, one of my favorite, uh, little, little anecdotal tales is about, I recorded a whole album called Plain Brown Rapper with mm-hmm. my band in the studio. We were done. We recorded and I sang all the vocals and, uh, and some of my, and my guys in my band sang on it too. We finished the record in four days. Oh my and in God. the other, the other studio in the, in the, uh, the other room, they were still working on a kick drum sound for a George Strait record. All that, all four days, and 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 I said, yeah, you can just see that guy in the truck stop put a quarter in the jukebox and get, go, hey, you Dale, uh, uh, <laughs> you think they had a little bit much six K on that kick drum? <laughs> and and pretty pretty soon you go, it's okay to be over. You know, you can go, you can actually produce and 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 work the life out of something. And um, if you listen to any of my records, you'll hear right. every now and then, you'll hear something of me that you go, was, was he out of tune there? Or the <laughs> timing didn't seem exactly right. And, and on almost every one of my records, um, the faith and freedom record are, are, you know, live. It, this is, this is how I sing. And, you know, maybe my timing's not great. Maybe I'm a little sharp somewhere, a little flat somewhere. But this is not. Let's go back and make everything yeah. perfect. Let's yeah, you don't ever like produce. Well, no, less is more. In fact, that's that's a pseudonym I use on one of the records. I call myself Lester S. Moore. Nice. For, uh, <laughs> as a writer on a song called uh, "Miles Across the Bedroom," was uh, on Capitol Records. And uh-huh. It's just less is more, and that's kind of what what I believe. And I go I go all the way back to listen. If you were listening. Really listen hard to the Beatles records, right? And then listen to a, a Today record. You go, ah, those Beatles records. They were horrible. I mean, I mean, they they're just they're everywhere. If you live in today's music world, the world of perfect timing and and, and programmed everything. So, so right. I go from that other side. I come from that side that you're going to hear some guitar squeaks and you're going to hear other stuff on my records. I'm not taking them out because that's what music sounded like to me. Nice. One of the things about um, whenever I go to write poetry or something, that, and I've been criticized for this a couple of times, is I will wait till the very last minute because I do a lot of public readings of them on a book I'm trying to produce or, or write. One of these days, it'll it'll get out there. But um, I wait till the last minute to write it, and they ask me why I, I do that, and um, I tell them because I can't second guess myself after I read it. And so once version 1.0 is over with, it's out there, and there is no 2.0 of a song, there's no 2.0 of a of um of a piece or anything like that. And so that's kind of one of the ways I've always found out is just like I'm not saying for yeah, wait for the last minute, but it's just like get it out there and do what you can, and then don't touch it because go off your natural instinct on it. So I think you're right. You know, there's a writer. You know, Harlan Coben. Uh, I think that's his name. Uh, he writes uh, kind of mystery books, uh, and it has a, a cast of characters, about four or five main characters. And and right. he writes his he writes his book. It's a, 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 he puts one out a year, and he writes it in I don't I don't remember whether it was two months or three months. But he then he takes off the rest of the year and doesn't write not a word. And then he'll sit down and he'll just write it out. And I love. To read his books, and there, it's like you say, and and kind of my philosophy uh, is, the creative juice jumps in there. You you create something, and you go, that's it. I can't make it perfect, but but that's that's what it is. And uh, Harlan Coben, <clears throat> I, I love his books, and I'm a I'm a big reader. So your um your album that you were just talking about, um, Faith and Freedom. Now yeah. this album, like you mentioned, 
is mostly re- recorded live songs. And one of the things that I like about what you did with this album and, and your philosophy on that is sometimes when I go to a concert, I'm so used to hearing the CD or, or the, the, the cassette or, or whatever um, uh-huh. so overly produced that it's you know almost over perfect. And then whenever you go to a concert, you don't hear that. There's no possible way you could ever go to a stadium and hear what you heard from a recording studio because of sounds and anything else. And um, and then so I've heard a lot of people say, "Oh, he just didn't sound like what he heard on the on the recording." And I'm like, "Well, you will never hear exactly what you hear on the recording unless you're in the recording studio." Um, and I think because you record your songs live, and like you said earlier, uh-huh. you leave in you know the guitar slip or the kick drum that was you know just uh-huh. a, you know half a beat off or something like that. That's um, I, I love that. I mean, that's a really great taste in terms of um, listening to true music in itself. Just play, and I think well, and there's a yeah, and, and Brian, there's a lot of you know as well as I know. There's a lot of people that um, you can tune anything. Yeah, you can you, you can go in the studio, and I can take somebody who can talk and make them a singer with today's technology. Right. And a lot of that is lost in live performance when you, you really get to hear what's going on. And, uh, and, and it, it is infinitely harder in an enclosed space to play a band and make it sound right because of, uh, of sound reflection. And, and so when I go out alone with a guitar, it's just one voice and one guitar. All you have to do nice. is just put it out there. And uh, you don't have to worry about whether the drums are too loud or whether the keyboard part is in or the, the orchestra. And, and I love playing with symphonies. You know, I've, I've played with a lot of them. I, I, I love that. But, but my favorite part of the night is always when I just get to pick up a guitar and sing. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. Whenever you just go solo like that and... Um, it's just you and the music and the song. And another thing that I, I love about your work is that you believe in the song and you believe there's there's the singer and the song and for the singer not to oversing the song, to not get in the way of the song. Correct? I do. I do. When, when, um, when I sang When Beneath My Wings, I thought my job as a singer was to get out of the way as a singer and just sing the words and the melody. And, uh, when I when I sing it live, I might I might embellish it a little more than what the record was, mm-hmm. but the record was so simple. That particular record was so uh, simple that uh, Warner Brothers L.A. called me. I was trying, I'll never forget it because I was at, uh, I was playing on the Warner Brothers softball team in Nashville. We were playing at some park, and uh, they got, somebody from A and R came over, rushed over, and said, "We got a problem. We got a problem. What, what's the problem?" I said. Well, your record that uh, "Wind Beneath My Wings" you that you sent, uh, we're, we're missing part of it. I went, "What are you talking about?" He says, "Well, there's not any like big stuff going on in it. We feel like there must have been something. There must have been some kind of screw up in the transmission of the parts." I went, "No, <laughs> that's all there is. It's just <laughs> what it is." And he went, and then I got a call. He says, "What are you trying to do? Kill your career?" You can't do that, and uh, then of course it ended up being song of the year. So it yeah. worked out. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you can get what I politely call building stupid, <laughs> which means if you live in a room and you go and you start trying to tell guys, well, you ought to be singing like this, you ought to be recording this, uh, and I'm sure it, it costs me dearly in, in other ways, but it's like. You know what? I'm out there, kind of in the trenches. I I see what works for me, and uh, so uh, but so at, at one point, the, the people in L.A. at Warner's were a little bit building stupid about it. But the Jimmy Bowen was, was the co-producer on that record, and, and he said, "No, nope, this is it. This is what we're going with," and uh, it worked out. Uh, well, um, your music the on the album for Faith and Freedom, talk a little bit about that more and why I think it's so special because you just released this album and um, one thing is is you write it about it on your spirituality and your your devotion to the U.S. military, which I'm an Iraqi war vet, so I really appreciate the music that you put out for that album um, and your spirituality on it. And you fully believe in both. And some of the spiritual yeah. songs that you have on there um, talks about world word pe- uh, world peace and you know different divisions in terms of making the peace. I think that song is titled um, "Where Love Is King." 
I think that's the one that I'm thinking yeah. of. Um, yeah. So I really love that album for that. For you can, well, to me, I, I you opened yourself that. up. I, I, I'm, you know, I've always been. I, I, I'm basically that. I'm basically a dove with talons. Okay. <laughs> I believe if we go to, if we go to war, we need to go in and annihilate the enemy and come home. I, I hate to say I, I'm Ron Paulish with, with regard you. to that, uh, but this being the world's policeman and and taking on the problems of the world, we have plenty of them here. And uh, but that song, you you picked a song that is really uh, there. There's some ultimate irony in that, Brian. I was in the studio. Uh, on 9-11, I was on my way to the studio, but uh, on the 10th, I had just finished Where Love is King, and it was up on the console, and I had, uh, I'd, I said, leave it up because I want to put a drum part on it. This is, there's a little kind of like march drum part at the front of the song. Right. And so I got into the studio, and and the planes were hitting the towers. And oh my everybody in my band, I, I had a son in New York City. My, my The bass player had a relative in the Pentagon. My drummer, a guy named Eddie Bear's daughter, was on the 36th floor of the second tower. Oh, and wow. he had two grandkids on the first floor. And we couldn't talk to anybody because, you know, cell phones were down. Everybody was down. And as it turned out, everybody was okay. When the first plane hit, Eddie's daughter hit the stairwell, went down and got the kids and left because she'd been there when there was that bombing in the basement. And I think oh, it was yeah. in 1990. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there I've got up on the console, uh, uh where love is king. And, uh, you know, it talks about the division of the North and the South and it talks about the division of the East and the West and having one earth and, and, uh, walk to the edge of forgiveness, take one more step, have mercy on your brother with no regrets, rise up where the heart rules and the voices sing in the land where love is king. And and I looked at it and I went, I can't put that out. I, I obviously left it on the record, but I can't put that out because people will go, well, there's that Gary Morris, boy, he's just jumping on, trying to to, to ride the wave of this war or whatever. And, right. and there's other songs, uh, um, uh, Time Will Tell, and, uh, which is on there, which was also uh, politically uh, incorrect. And uh, so I've always had a little bit of that uh, speak for the people, um, and, and it's not really right-wing rhetoric, rhetoric. I don't know whether you would call it left wing rhetoric but it's about it's about you know we've got one planet and we've got one civilization we have lots of countries and lots of different dialects and lots of different languages but we have one civilization on this earth and so I uh, I write about it and sing about it and whether people care or not if they come out and hear me they're going to hear something about something of that and that we're loving nice. King on that particular record was, I think, live from California. I was playing a concert in California. But the the Faith and Freedom record, Ryan, goes all the way back to, uh, there's one cut on it, the last cut on the record, called The Last Full Measure of Devotion. And that's a live performance on a CBS television special that happened after the first Gulf War. And they scrolled across my face while that's, I was singing that song on live television, the names of the soldiers killed in the first Gulf War. And, uh, people, people asked for that for years. Said, would you record that? And I never re-recorded it. I got that. It's actually the live, uh, from television performance. And, uh, they uh, allowed me to put it on this record. So this record kind of spans a long period of time and, and several continents and, and then the the title cut was new. Uh, I wrote it with Pat Bunch from Nashville uh, back in the spring, and so everything else is spans a little bit of time. Now you've played a lot of different places, literally all uh -huh. over the world, and some really amazing places. Um, I think practically in every continent, almost if if I miscounted. Yeah. 
Um, what are some of the favorite places you've played for and the people? You've played in front of some amazing people. Um, can you talk about some of your favorite places and people? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've done two live records, and, I, and they were both done in the Eccles Theater in Logan, Utah. Now, why? Because it's this fantastic little tiny, well, it's 1,200, 1,400 seats, I guess, 100-plus-year-old, um, I believe, theater that's been refurbished. And the people there, and, and why, I don't know, but the people in Utah, for some reason, gravitated to my music. There'd be people in there that could sing every word to every album cut I ever had. And nice. So I, I, I loved going there to play. Uh, I loved the performance on the stage in New York uh, in Les Mis. I loved doing that. I played <clears throat> in... That's uh, one of my favorite plays. Because you played yeah, the I lead played role, right? I Jean played, Valjean? I played Jean Valjean in Les Mis, and uh, I was the first American to do that. So that was kind of a cool thing to do. I, I, it, it's, it's interesting to me... Um, how people are different and how they respond differently. Like, I didn't understand Canadians. I played with Merle Haggard in Canada, in outdoors, there were, I think, 50,000 people. Wow. And of all things, Merle opened for me, and I thought, oh, this can't be. But And, and he, he did a show and just got polite applause. I thought, oh, what's going to happen when I go out there? And I played, and the people, I mean, it was just, it, and I, it was polite applause. So I thought, I'm not used to this. So I, on my closing song, I started climbing the light truss with a, with a microphone. Like, I guess I thought I was a rock and roll guy for a moment. <laughs> and I got about 30 feet in the air and everybody, it was outdoors. Everybody was standing and cheering and clapping. I thought, they want me to die. I, that's what they really want, but <laughs> no. they wouldn't. And then they were trying to call me back on for an encore, one more music, and I'm going, no, they don't really want to hear me. They want to see me jump <laughs> from up there. So, uh, and, and people in, um, uh, I played down in Australia and in New Zealand, and uh, New Zealand's one of my favorite places. But the, the, you know, it's it, it's kind of a European light uh, audience, uh, hungry. Uh, Czechoslovakia, some of those Eastern blocks, they just loved it because I didn't have to live by their rules. They had, you know, they had the, the communist block, uh, countries, Eastern block countries. Their artists had to stand perfectly still and weren't allowed to emulate the West at all for the oh, longest no. period of time. And, and, uh, and I found I had a lot of fans over there. So it, it, it's, it, in America, in America, you know, I, I'm going to say I, I will play. I I would rather play for uh, either ten thousand people that don't know who I am, that I've got a closed room that I can work for them, or what. Either they don't. No one knows me in the house or in a room where everybody knows me. One or the other, because if everybody knows me, they're going to ask for. For songs that I really want to sing, and if nobody knows me, I get to surprise them. Right. Well, I would be surprised if you get a room where ten thousand people don't know who you are. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> good luck trying to find that. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you mean you wouldn't sing that "Wind Beneath My Wings" one more time? I well, I would sing it. I think I'll, I'll have to sing it. Uh, I have to sing it this afternoon. As a matter of fact, we're <laughs> oh, doing no. some kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I'll sing it a cappella. Well, you know, that's I just sing it about ten different keys. <laughs> well, that's just um, honor to you um, producing such a, and creating such a great song. So every time they yeah, ask you to you. sing it or whatever else, I mean, because I mean, you've won your awards are amazing. You, you're a Grammy Award winner for Les Mis, um, with CMAs, Billboard, uh, Drama Desk uh -huh. Awards. The, I mean, the list uh -huh. just goes on and on and on. And so when people keep asking for your songs, I mean, that's just that's just beauty and grace in the making. Please enjoy Gary singing a song from Les Mis, singing Bring Him Home.
we've been incredibly lucky to have been blessed with some brilliant uh, Jean Valjeans all the way around the world. Our original London and Broadway star, Con Wilkinson, the great Irish troubadour, was followed by a marvellous country and western singer, Gary Morris. And in Tel Aviv, a uh, marvellous Israeli cantor, Dudu Fisher, is currently wowing them. And it uh, looks like he'd be playing Vajan indefinitely there. With all these wonderful performances all the way around the world, I felt it was time to capture some of these on one complete symphonic recording. The difficulty has been making the choice. You know, come to think about it, you do have, and we mentioned this earlier, you do have this new project coming up that you're going to be doing at the Grand Ole Opry with this new album that you have yeah. coming out. Can we talk about that some? Yeah. Well, it, if if you were mine is is a new project, and um, I was talking with my manager and said, you know, I've I've seen a lot of records, uh, uh, a lot of different artists do albums of somebody's music that are love songs and stuff, and and I've got a, a wad of songs because because I've continued to write whether I've been played on radio or, or not. I've decided I, I'm not going to, when I do go out, play just my history. If I, and when I don't have anything to say anymore or another point of view, then I, then I, then I, I just won't go out and play. So this particular... Nice record is maybe some different looks at at, at relationships and love and and uh, the, the first single I'm uh, going to play on the Grand Ole Opry which would have been <clears throat> I lost my father three years ago and that was his favorite thing what, as a young boy was to go huddle up by the by the radio and listen to the Grand Ole Opry so this song I'm going to play on the Grand Ole Opry, and you all have a copy of it, and uh, I'm hoping you all will play it. It's uh, called must, If You Remind. Uh, must definitely. And it's very, very raw. It's it's uh, it's two guitar tracks and me singing, and it's live a live vocal. It is what you get, and um, it, it's it's a love song. So very happy. <laughs> I hope you like it, and I hope everybody here hears it like it. It, it. And we're going to do something a little different. We're going to release songs off this project either every four weeks or every six weeks. We're going to release one song, and it will then uh, be people. It'll be available on you know all of the download CD Baby, Amazon, blah blah blah. And uh, so, if people like it, they can uh, they can get it. And if they don't like it, then they don't have to waste their money on it. So, well, I think that's just kind of teasing people a little bit, don't you think? Or is that is that I the hope plan? So. <laughs> <laughs> the plan is if you like this one, wait till you hear the next. One. <laughs> the, nice the, strategy. You know, uh, usually, I mean, I mean, the the old way of releasing a record is you put a record out and they and the radio, 
I mean, radio or record company will pick your three singles. And, and, uh, the singles on radio were used, you know, your, your single had better be able to sell a Ford truck <laughs> because, because it's just filler between commercials. And, and, and when, uh, you know, I, I, I've heard that firsthand from, uh, people in radio. You don't want to, you don't want to distract from the commercials that we're going to have with your records. And wow. so, so it, it, this is a, a, a little different approach. So it's just how we're going to do it. Well, I like that. Now, most of the songs on this, on this release that's coming up, um, mm-hmm. is, would you say most of them are love songs? Well, yeah, but you know, there's, it's love songs, but you can say it's, uh, uh, they could be positive love songs or maybe not so positive love songs. And, and, you know, I, I think I was talking when we, before we even started recording, I, you know, I said, really every song's about love. It's, it's, a, it's <laughs> about some kind of love, whether it's love of the country or, or love to hate or whatever it is. <laughs> right. How do you, how do you write a story? With there, uh, without there being some emotion in it. And most of the time, it involves whether it's a, about a parent or a sibling or a tree or a river or, or the sky or death or life. It, there, somehow, uh, love's involved in it. So saying this is an album of love songs means that it's an album of songs and uh, there's there's uh, the intention of love in them. Nice. So... Well, I have a feeling that there's going to be one of these that will make um, the airways just as much as wind. And so you never know that one of these these next quote-unquote love songs that will be coming on and be like, man, I've been singing that song for the for the next 30 years. And that's a good thing. Well, so. I, hope this song, I hope this first one is the one because it, it's really a special song. Yeah, if you it's remind. very simple. If you were mine. Then it, I mean, I mean the, the sentiment is if you, you were mine, <clears throat> um, uh, and, and well, I'll, I'll give you a little uh, pre. If you were mine, and I gave all my love to you. Would that be enough to see us through to the end of time? Um, uh, and then it goes progresses from there. But there's there's uh, the last verses. Uh, all I want is nothing more than everything. And I think that's kind of a sentiment that. Wow. That people who love each other, that's what they want. They want everything. And, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is what it is. It, it's a, it's, it's not a, uh, big orchestrated piece, although I could have done that with it. It's just simply a guitar and a voice and, and I think a pretty straight ahead story. Well, you always, you've always been quoted in terms of, um, writing what you know. And so for you coming out will work works like this I think it's um, I think it's pretty good I think it'll touch a lot of people's hearts and um, minds and, and their creative thinking processes so and that's one of the other things I like about your songs is um, for me for a song it has to, to rip emotionally it really has to make me think and that's what your music does um, being an emotional person that I am it's um, mm-hmm. it's coming out with your material it just really touches at people's hearts and, and you know, tugs at their, at their collars and everything else in order for them to, um, to really understand. And, and it's so well done. So I'm excited. And this is coming out February the 4th on, on Grand Ole Opry. So I'm, I'm excited for you. And I love well, your strategy. Well, thank you. Well, the, uh, you know what? I've said for the longest time that I think music has to do one of three things. It either has to move you emotionally or move you intellectually, or it has to move your feet. Uh, and yeah. if it moves your feet, it doesn't have to do those other things because that's not what the song was intended for. And and seldom do you get more than one of those two things happening. But if you can make two of those things happen in uh, in a song that makes you think and moves you emotionally, or makes your feet move, and makes you think, or you know, if you can right. do two of those things, you, you really have have a uh, a winner. Now, um, for future projects and shows that we have coming on, we've got Grand Ole Opry that's coming up on February the fourth, and you're releasing your um, 
song of your your new album titled same self-titled uh, album if you were mine and the first song that's coming out is if you were mine it's going to be on itunes and amazon um, released every six weeks what are some other stuff that you have coming out well singles will be following that up most of the shows that are on my books right now are private shows uh, i i done i did a uh uh a show that was uh, what I thought was going to be Broadway bound, and I went to uh, spent some time down in Florida and and uh, looked at it, and it doesn't it didn't feel like that's where it was going to go. So I had already told my agent and management don't book anything for uh, the spring because I think I might be going to New York. So my calendar is way more open right now than it's been in a long time, and uh, so. The, other than the private shows, um, there's some a few scattered shows get, uh, set for the summer right now, but they're fast at work on trying to put me in performing arts centers and theaters for uh, uh, for the spring and into the summer. Okay. Now, where can people go to look for that? Is that on your website, Gary Morris? It's, it's all on my website, right? Okay, so that's Gary Morris dot com. Everybody needs to go there and check that out. Um, and there they can find all kinds of photos of you and your music, um, um, bio work and everything else. Um, I've, obviously, I've been there. I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of yours. Um, Thank you. Now, you also have a Facebook page and Twitter and s some other social media, right? Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not the greatest typer, so if you if I'm typing something, there'll be typos in it, but you just got to figure it out. If the... If the, <laughs> if the you know, if the uh, the phone doesn't turn it to porn, which it seems like about <laughs> oh, half the God. time, I if I don't read it, I went, I didn't. How did that get there? <laughs> so, anyway, I, I'm a little more careful now. Uh, I've, I've sent a couple of uh, sent a couple of texts that I that I got a call back saying, "What do you mean by that?" And I had to reread it. I went, "I didn't write that." <laughs> <laughs> the, the phone wrote that. So so yeah, but I, I'm now. Participating in social media as best I can, I find it takes away from my writing. And I've got a I've got a song I'm right, I've I'm not quite finished called uh, "She's Got Poison in Her Water." And, uh, water. She got poison in her water, and she wants me to drink. And uh, <laughs> and and I find myself <laughs> drinking is is uh, good. But uh, you know, I, and I, I've got a, a lot of. Uh, the songs right now that I'm really kind of buckling down trying to get finished up so I can finish this whole project and uh, and then I'll be starting on another one. Nice. If so, my man's got to work. Oh yeah, definitely. So if um, if you are texting somebody or you're, you're typing on some of these social media networks like Twitter or whatever and, and for all the listeners out there and fans of Gary, if it does seem like a weird text or type or something like that, he's typing through you, not at you. So. Yeah, I tried. <laughs> through you, through the waste back behind you. Oh, definitely. Now, obviously, um, you still love writing songs to this day, and will continue writing songs, and we so greatly appreciate that for the work that you do. Um, what are some final thoughts you would like for everyone to know about you, or just for your work or anything? Yeah, oh, you know, I, I would go. Um, somebody said sixties the new thirty. Um, uh, and I don't know if that's true or not, but um, I have I have decided uh, that I, I took some time off, and um, so uh, my voice is actually as good or better than it was certainly when I was forty. And uh, so I'm back out there uh, singing, and um, I, I, I want people to risk coming out. I I I, w I would give them a money back guarantee if they don't enjoy their evening. That you know, hit me up. I'll be signing autographs after the show. I'll give them back their <laughs> twenty or thirty or whatever it is. But um, um, and and we have to get as a uh, we have to get past entertainment by the pound. Um, you know, it's like I I, I know buyers that say, well, what do you mean? He wants he just wants to go out with his guitar well what about his band and and yet you'll take a comedian and say well why doesn't he have 10 comedians with him well he yeah, can by exactly, himself exactly 
and and uh, and it's the old entertainment by the pound. Um, we have to get past that. Also, the, the world of entertainment today, and, and in, in country music, Garth started it and was a, a genius at doing it. He cre- what he did was he recreated uh, rock and roll in a uh, country format with a big the big stage, the big screens, the multi screens, and then and then uh, and everybody's followed suit. And it's it's very difficult if you go out and see Reba, and Reba has uh, I, I know I don't know what she's doing now, but I know uh, in the early nineties when she would go into a town, she would have eighty something hotel rooms and three trucks and. Uh, three buses and whatever. Well, when I go into town, I have one airfare and and a hotel room, and I carry a sound man with me. But right. so, but but I don't think I don't think it's um, it's uh, it, it's 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 separate but equal, if you will. What I do is different, and um, and, and I'm not saying there's not other guys out doing it, but right. but. But it, it's not less; it's just different. Exactly. And, uh, when when people go, you know, I'd love to take my wife or my girlfriend or my daughter or my family out and and not go away deaf and have been entertained and hear some good music. Then then uh, when when I show up, that'd be that'd be I think a pretty good bet. But that's how I would leave it. Nice. Well, I definitely love that type of music whenever I go out um, and just to have a good night. There's been some times that I've gone out and it's just been so crazy listening to the to the to the noise that um, I didn't really enjoy yeah. the time. And so your unplugged sets and just you and the guitar and just the music, I think that's absolutely beautiful. And I know a lot Thank of people you, enjoy that as well. I appreciate it. Oh, definitely. Well, on behalf of everyone on our show, I want to thank you, Gary, for uh, for being here and for all the success that you had over the years and for all the success that you have coming up um, for so many, many more years. And uh, if I can get the chance to get to one of your concerts, I definitely will. And uh, I appreciate it. I'll look for you. <laughs> definitely. I'll be like, yay. That'll be me out yeah. there. <laughs> all right, pal. All right. Thank you. You have a great day. Thank you so much. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Please welcome our musical guest, Gary Morris, with If You Were Mine. And I gave all my love to you Would it be enough to see us through Till the end of time If you were mine Could you trust your heart to me alone Let me wrap you up and take you home If you were only mine There's a moment when you bring a raging fire You lift me up, I see angels in your choir Then you touch me where it's out of my control The angels sing We go where only lovers go If you were mine I would only have a single wish For you If you love and love completely Say I do Nothing more than everything Forget the past The presence What I bring Let me hold you Where you're out of control And come with me Where only 
lovers go if you were mine there would never be another shattered dream I'd be bursting at the seams loved by every means if you And now, a word from our sponsors. At Tyler Gifts, we do customized monogramming and embroidery. We can monogram anything from a simple one name on a bib for a baby to a customized logo on a company shirt. We can make gifts for your wedding entourage and gifts for your friends. Label your children's items for school and put names on jerseys for sports. If you have items of your own you want to monogrammed and embroidered, we can do that. Taylor Gifts are sewn with high-quality thread on a professional embroidery machine. So go to the website, www.taylorgifts.net, call 251-391-4354, Email sales at taylorgifts.net, visit us at ETSY, and Facebook us. We are ready for your orders. Welcome to WROM, Realms of Music Radio and Social Network. We support independent artists and talk shows, hosting a large discussion forum and an artist gallery. We also have a large social network combining the best of Facebook and MySpace into one. So make sure you submit your music to us and create a profile to promote yourself today. That's realmsofmusic.com, the best of music radio. The Ghost Tales Television Network, GTN. GTN is designed to give the paranormal TV and filmmaking community the opportunity to showcase their talents and creations. If you believe you have what it takes to create your very own TV show and or short film and you would like the opportunity to showcase your creations, you may contact us at ghosttalestv at gmail.com or call 901-377-7166 for more details. Make sure you visit ghosttalestv.com, GTN, America's Paranormal Superstation. Thank you for listening to the show. I am your host, Brian Lee Watley. I hope you have an amazing weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next time when another story begins. Until then, love and light.